Hi, I'm Mark Gaylor. I'd like to take the opportunity to talk to you about uh, the way I capture powerful portraits. And we can take a look at uh, my uh, lighting styles, uh, my composition, and also the camera settings I use uh, for successful portraits each and every time. Okay, so if you want to catch up with me after this presentation, you can find uh, a lot of free information uh, on my website, which is markgaylor.com. Okay, so... Um, Obviously the primary uh, thing that I would encourage you to focus on when looking at portraits is of course lighting. It is the photographer's medium and it will make a huge difference to the portraits you're capturing. Okay, some people will uh, dive into flash photography a little bit prematurely before they master and before they look at the ambient light that uh, we can actually work with. For instance, this was captured with uh, an A7S II, 51,200 ISO admittedly, but this uh, image would be completely destroyed by the addition of flash lighting because the light source is the mobile phone that this young woman is holding. So my encouragement or my advice really is to master your ambient light first. Um, this is an image that I've captured um, just using the ambient light and carefully choosing the background. We can also position our subject in light that is very favorable or flattering to the subject. We'll be looking at an alternative uh, uh, portrait that I captured of this young man using flash later in the presentation. So when you're um, uh, looking at your uh, subject that you want to photograph, if, even if it's only a fleeting portrait uh, image that you're capturing, it's important to look at how that uh, lighting is playing uh, with the shapes of the face to see whether that is an appropriate um, vantage point for you to be capturing this portrait. Because often we do get the opportunity to move around our subject to change either the way the light is falling on our subject or the background behind the subject. Okay, I would also encourage you to look not only at the light, but also the shadows. Uh, sometimes the shadows can ruin a, um, a portrait. Uh, maybe dappled light coming through the leaves of trees uh, can create a mottled appearance uh, and then ruin the, uh, the shape of the face in many instances. Okay, so looking at light and looking at the shadows is my primary advice. One of my favorite lights, uh, lighting conditions for portrait is not sunlight, but uh, where light is being diffused through cloud cover. I can also move my sitters into the shadows uh, to remove uh, the problems that sometimes sunlight can cause. Um, this flat lighting um, I've used successfully on, um, on many occasions and um, uh, it obviously creates this uh, flattering light that we can uh, we can work with and uh, the power is coming through the color in this instance uh, in fact both of these images they're successful because of my my vantage point uh, the way that I'm framing my image uh, you'll notice that I'm getting quite close to my portraits and we'll look take a look at my composition style in a lot more detail a little bit later so always um, working um, uh, close to my subject, I'm engaging with my subject most of the time. I'm not taking candid snaps of the people that I want to feature in my photographic narratives. I'm approaching them and uh, I'm working with them to get the best possible portraits of them at ease. I don't ask people to pose for me, I just get them nice and relaxed in front of the camera. And this is just um, through maybe just experience of approaching people, not spending too long with the camera settings uh, but basically uh, taking an interest in them what they're doing uh, and then um, working very quickly to get them at ease okay so uh, this is actually taken in the rain uh, they say there's no such thing as um, bad weather for photography just different sorts of lighting and uh, the um, the overcast lighting on this particular early morning um, is beautiful for taking these beautiful soft lit portraits Okay, and if on a sunny day you're, um, you're not liking that sunlight, uh, it's amazing how quickly we can seek out much softer lighting. Um, the, the, this is actually a bright sunny day, and on top of the pier we have some very harsh lighting. But uh, I can quickly just move the, uh, the subject underneath the pier and access a much softer light uh, coming in from the daylight that's entering to one side. And uh, this is a way that I can craft my portraits. Uh, when I'm engaging with the models and they're working with me. 
Okay, sometimes uh, we will again uh, look at the, uh, the the quality of lighting coming in from a, maybe a low angle or direction. Um, and this is the sort of thing that um, stage lighting or theatrical lighting does. It uh, removes the lighting from overhead and pushes it in from a lower vantage point such as the side. This uh, portrait is not actually a studio portrait. It's lit uh, by the light coming through an open doorway and an open window. And uh, it creates so it doesn't create flat lighting it creates this beautiful uh, modeling light source and this is actually very difficult to achieve when using um, uh, flash lighting and so uh, working with uh, window light and uh, the light coming through open doorways is probably uh, one of the best light sources that you can get as a portrait photographer now um, uh, sometimes when we have to modify sunlight because we can't remove the subject out of that harsh lighting we can use um, these uh, five in one uh, lighting kits they're not very expensive like if I just uh, I'll, this is actually a part of a movie that I'll just stop so you don't have to watch all of this this is me just using a diffuser sometimes where I refer to it as a scrim if I just cycle through to the point where I actually get my assistant to move the, the diffuser um, and um, basically uh, remove the harsh lighting. We can see the very awkward shadows at the moment that we're dealing with in harsh sunlight but just the process of putting that very inexpensive diffuser over you can see how that will interact with the model and here it goes is just moving that into place and creating that soft directional light um, that is excellent for portraiture. When I'm working with um, portrait, I actually um, gravitate to uh, certain lenses that I prefer to use. And these usually aren't the zoom lenses that um, are often easy to work with because we don't have to change our position in relation to the subject. But uh, what I do like um, to be able to do is drop the backgrounds out of focus. Uh, we can get some beautiful bokeh or background blur behind our subjects. And this focuses the viewer's attention on the subject and not any distractions that might be happening in the background. Fortunately for photographers, these are relatively inexpensive lenses to purchase. Um, the 50mm 1.8 lens is an excellent portrait lens for people working with cameras with crop sensors or APS-C sensors. They're some of the most affordable lenses that the manufacturers make and they do give that figure ground separation basically dropping that background out of focus. If you are working with a full frame camera I would encourage you to maybe look at a slightly longer prime lens, uh, something like the 85mm 1.8. There are some 1.4 um, aperture lenses available at this focal length, but they tend to be twice as heavy and, and more than twice as expensive as the 1.8s. And some of these 1.8 um, 85s is enough to create that figure ground separation, and they can be exceptionally sharp. Uh, the Sony 1.8 that I'm using quite a lot these days is actually sharp wide open that, and that gives me that beautiful figure ground separation. Sometimes I like to work um, with a little bit of a longer focal length when doing portrait at events um, where I'm having less time to interact with my sitter and sometimes I'm standing a little bit further away than my preferred working distance which is with that 85 mil on a full frame or 50 mil on a crop sensor. Uh, and uh, I've been working with this uh, Batis 135 and that again is excellent uh, when using it at the widest aperture which is 2.8. Okay, so let's get on to some um, uh, tips about uh, composition. Okay, for me this is um, as uh, the next best thing that we can do to choosing a suitable uh, lighting uh, for a photographic portrait. Now um, we often refer to the vertical framing as a portrait orientation but I have to say even though I do capture some images in the vertical or portrait format uh, my preferred uh, format for shooting portrait is actually the horizontal format uh, often referred to as the landscape format. What it does is it allows me to 
to uh, create, uh, be more creative with my design and composition. And it also includes uh, a lot more of the background uh, bokeh in my subjects. We'll just go back one slide and just show you these tight portraits of these uh, subjects here. We have very little background uh, around the subject, so we can't really admire that beautiful uh, out of focus bokeh that we can when we uh, use the uh, landscape or horizontal orientation. If you're working in editorial as well, these um, uh, horizontal framings also give the desktop publishers a lot more freedom when working with their desktop layouts. They can use that negative space, that background blur, for dropping in type or text or uh, the, the heading of the story that you're working with. And so you're giving those people a lot more creative freedom. And these horizontal framings with our megapixel rich cameras that we're using these days can always be cropped to vertical later. When you're working with relative strangers that you might have only just met, um, there is a slight temptation for newcomers in photography to stand a little bit too far away. And so when you're working with this interesting couple that I, I found uh, riding uh, unicycles, there is a temptation to feel uncomfortable on their behalf uh, and uh, end the portrait session a little bit too soon. But for me, um, I would actually then move a lot closer. Now, you'll notice this in Hollywood, the tight head and sh uh, shoulder shot is, uh, is is a feature of many of those uh, ways that the camera can move closer to look into the character and soul of the subject that we're working with. And we can really see that expression come to life if we get a little bit closer. Now, when we're getting this close, uh, we're often cropping in to the top of the head. And this is also something that a lot of uh, newcomers to photography don't feel comfortable doing. But again, if you look at that Hollywood tight head and shoulder shot, um, that is a feature of nearly every movie, you're gonna see that they are coming in this close. We are gonna crop into the top of the head and it looks quite natural uh, because we're so used to it in the movies. And so this will be a big feature of my own portrait photography is to create this very tight uh, composition. Okay, so the other thing that I would encourage you to do when you're coming in this um, tight is there is a tendency again for newcomers of photography to put the eyes in the uh, center of the frame. Typically you need to raise those above center. Okay, so um, this gives a little bit more um, a relaxed composition, a little bit more um, space under the chin and puts the eyes out of the center of the frame for a more dynamic composition. We can see this, uh, is, it's a natural framing for me. Some people will refer to it as uh, often the rule of thirds, but typically I'm using a, a ratio called the golden uh, ratio, which is a much more comfortable place just to put the eyes just above center. And also the um, the chin, just make sure that for most of these portraits using this uh, horizontal format is we're not putting the chin too close to the base of the frame. It can look a little bit um, uh, tight if we do that uh, too often. Okay, so this is an interesting character I've photographed uh, at um, uh, an event and uh, we can see that uh, my uh, framing or composition would typically go into that golden ratio. We can actually get these overlays to appear when we're cropping our images in post-production. Here I've, I'm cropping out even tighter than where I was st standing when I captured uh, this fellow. And you can see those lines are traveling through basically the eyeballs of this portrait. And that is the golden ratio that I'm using, not the rule of thirds. Typically when I encounter somebody um, for a photo narrative that I'm creating and I want this character in my story, I'll, um, I'll see them uh, at a distance first. So I just wanted to give you an example of uh, where I've um, first spotted a character and then how close I will move in to that character to get the hero shot. And this is uh, the hero shot from that character that I saw from that distance. If we just go back one slide, uh, just to take a note of the background that I'm choosing. I'm choosing uh, not only how I approach him, but also 
uh, the, the way that I'm going to approach this person will put um, my favored background behind the subject. So the background that I'm choosing is going to be that wall. And the closer I go to my subject, uh, the more out of focus that background will go. So we're actually losing that uh, structure of the wall and it's becoming that very smooth bokeh. And now the highlights falling on the face are the brightest part of the composition. Okay, and so this has created this um, uh, effective portrait for me. Okay, one of the other things to consider about compositions where you may have um, a, a horizon line in the image is that horizon line will often pass through the neck or the head of your sitter uh, or your subject. And one way is um, to control the composition is just change your height in relation to the subject. Now, just a simple act of bending the knees, for instance, will lower the horizon line and push that horizon line down through the shoulders. This will create more negative space, uh, more background bokeh, and uh, remove that distracting, uh, very strong design element, the horizon line, down perhaps onto that golden ratio or rule of thirds uh, composition that you might be looking to create. So just remember, uh, think about your vantage point, not only your relation um, to the subject in the background, but also your height to the subject. Okay, sometimes we are faced with impossible backgrounds, backgrounds that will look a little bit uh, busy or cluttered, even if we're using a wide open aperture. Um, but don't underestimate what we can do in post production. We can actually dodge and burn. Some of these are some of the oldest tools known to photographers in dark rooms, which is to make tones lighter or darker. So we have some distracting highlights behind uh, this subject that I'm photographing here. So just grabbing a brush with a negative exposure value and brushing that over those highlights can often uh, get me that um, composition and focus on the lighting that I want to achieve. If we go back one, you will also notice that I played a little bit with the color here. Uh, I couldn't uh, dictate uh, the color of the t-shirt this guy is wearing because the whole um, portrait session is going to unfold in just a minute or two. So what I'm doing in post-production is I'm taking that color that is a little bit distracting to the composition and I'm just desaturating saturating that green color. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, some of the camera settings that I would start um, a portrait session with. Now, I will often vary these settings, but the, it's always good to have a starting point. Now, I often refer to these as my safe settings, and you can program, program them into the memory of a camera. I have these portrait or wide aperture portraits uh, settings programmed in on the top of my shoot mode dial on my cameras. Now, shutter speed, uh, even though I've got a camera with um, uh, stabilization or using stabilized lenses, uh, vibration reduction, um, uh, Nikon call them, is I will still make sure that the shutter speed doesn't go too slow. And that is because even though I'm confident that I can hold the camera still in my hands, the subject might move slightly. So I do want to raise that minimum shutter speed um, to maybe 1 1 60th of a second. The aperture that I will typically start at, it might, even if I own a 1.4 lens, I'm not going to start at 1.4. When we're working very close, the depth of field will be very shallow. So even though an 85mm 1.4 or 1.8 lens is going to give figure ground separation, typically I'll use that 1.4 aperture when I'm standing further away from my subjects. And I will stop down a little as I get closer. So I'd actually start at f4 or or 2.8 on a crop sensor and then go wider uh, if I want to push that background further out of focus. You do have to be careful though with very very shallow depth of field because we're always trying to get the eyes pin sharp uh, and there is a possibility that if you're working wider than f4 on a full frame camera you may lose that um, focus on the eyes if your technique isn't solid. Okay, so we've looked at focus on the eyes. Now I will look at um, a technique just uh, shortly, um, which is called IAF on the cameras that I use, the Sony cameras. This uh, helps me always get the eyes uh, sharp if I'm working with that shallow depth of field. And exposure compensation. Tip 
Typically, I'm using the multi or segment exposure, um, uh, sorry, the, uh, the metering in the camera. Uh, this is uh, usually the most reliable, but occasionally uh, we can underexpose or overexpose depending on the tonality of our subject. In this instance, uh, for an example, the subject is wearing uh, a lot of white and that could cause the camera to underexpose slightly. Um, most modern full frame cameras are tolerant to a little bit of underexposure and we can correct that in post. But typically I would be correcting it in camera as well. So in an instance like this, I might be raising one stop um, to counteract those very bright tones in this image. So we've looked at that minimum shutter speed and, and this is a prime example. This is a fleeting portrait that I've captured of this man standing in this doorway. And um, there is a chance that this guy is going to move as I take the picture. And so that uh, 1 1 60th of a second is going to help um, ensure that I that my hit rate for sharp images is going to be much higher than if I set, say, the shutter speed at a 50th of a second, which could introduce a little bit of subject blur if that subject is moving as I press my shutter release. Okay, some people believe um, uh, focus points. The most accurate focus point is using a small AF point. And uh, if you have time to place this uh, AF, po AF point uh, carefully, then yes, they can be accurate, but in most portraiture, we don't have that time if our subject is moving. This would be an example of an unreliable small AF point. Because what that AF point is looking for, it's looking um, for uh, an edge with high contrast. And if that's placed um, on a cheek or on a nose with no strong lines, then the AF may struggle and we may miss focus. Really, if you're going to um, use a small AF point, you need to be able to position that over um, something with high contrast edges, such as an eye, very, very quickly. Um, so um, that is a technique that some people will choose. Personally, I would just go to uh, a zone uh, focus. I tend to start with a wide focus area and only come down smaller if and when I need to. Now, face detection is also a feature for many cameras, and just switching that on will also help the camera find focus quickly. Zone, uh, we're coming back to this image. Um, typically, when we're using um, a wide AF area, you're using the whole screen and letting the camera choose the AF area. Um, cam um, some cameras can be um, distracted by subjects that are much closer to the camera than our primary subject. In this instance, you'll see, for instance, we have a character standing on the left and also the right, and some cameras would jump to those to pull focus. Uh, just pulling down to a smaller zone from wide AF will tell the camera ignore um, subjects that are standing at the edge that are close to me uh, and then just push through to the subject in the zone that I'm um, uh, showing the camera. So I've talked about IAF. Now when we're working this close, this is pr pretty much the only time I would uh, work wider than f4 on a full frame 85 or 135 prime lens. And that is if I have the confidence that the camera is supporting me by finding the eye in the face. Typically when we're working at very wide apertures, um, the tip of the nose and the ears will be well out of focus uh, when we're working at these ultra wide apertures such as f1.8. IAF will quickly snap on almost instantaneously and for the camera that I'm using it will also work in continuous auto fo uh, focus so if the subject is walking towards me um, the camera will track the eye even at wide apertures. Okay, so on the uh, latest model Sony cameras that I'm using, the third generation of uh, A7 cameras and also the A9 camera, one of the um, great features for IAF is it now works when the, um, the subject is in profile view. So we can actually snap uh, IAF onto the eye of a face even though the character is turned into profile view away from the camera lens.
Okay, so we might uh, have now a newfound confidence to work at those much wider apertures, but there I should give you a word of warning. Uh, we've been looking at um, single subjects here, getting in tight to a single portrait, but occasionally we do um, portraits with more than one person. Uh, or the sitter uh, or subject that we're working with turns um, slightly away from the camera and therefore the depth of field may not be sufficient to cover both eyes. In this portrait, for instance, we can see the leading eye, the eye that is closest to the camera is pin sharp, but the eye that is a little bit further away from the camera is a little bit soft, it's a little bit um, defocused. And this is even stopping down to f5.6 in this instance at a 70 mil focal length. So what I would encourage you to do is if you have um, two subjects um, and you want both of them sharp because one isn't more important than the other, I would encourage you if you have been working at f1.8 or 2.8 or even f4, stop down. I would typically stop down to f5.6 or f8 depending on the depth of the subject, i.e. Is, is one sitter or subject standing behind the other, or are their eyes relatively close on the same focal plane, i.e. the same distance from the camera. So in this instance where one um, subject is uh, um, standing behind another, I would uh, stop down to that f5.6 or even f8 if I'm working close. Okay, so uh, if the eyes are you're fairly confident that the eyes are the same distance from the lens. You can open up if you're confident uh, and get both uh, subjects sharp. This is actually shooting on the Batis 135 wide open at f2.8. So the depth of field is quite shallow, but both subjects are the same distance from the camera lens. So I've managed to nail the focus on both of these subjects, even when working wide open. But that can be rare, and you don't want to start losing subjects because the, the depth of the subject is a little bit um, uh, larger than you anticipated. Uh, for an example of this is this portrait of these three monkeys. I've actually stopped down three stops on an 80 film 5mm prime lens, but because of my proximity to the subjects, i.e. I'm very close, um, the, the monkey in the top left hand corner, although the whiskers on the mouth are sharp, the eyes are starting to go a little bit soft. It's okay in this instance, but you wouldn't want to be pushing that uh, further out of focus in this instance. I'll give you one of uh, my tips for uh, techniques that I use uh, quite a lot for um, good lighting in a composition, and that is if uh, I'm struggling to find an appropriate background, my first port of call is to look for an open doorway. Uh, this is a sculptor Jim Dolan standing in front of his workshop. The workshop was very cluttered and it was difficult for me to find an appropriate background. So I've invited Jim to come to the door of the workshop and uh, we're shooting um, uh, beyond the doorway into the workshop. But the light passing through the doorway falls off very quickly, i.e. it becomes very dark. And this gives me the figure ground separation in tonality as well as um, focus that I'm looking for uh, when I'm achieving. It's also given Jim um, a prop to lean on, uh, so his whole body relaxes into this portrait session. Here's another example of the open doorway. This is just a roller door at a sort of a factory situation. But again, um, getting uh, the, the subject close to the doorway, but not out in the sunlight, just uh, one or two steps uh, back into the shadows. And then the light falls off very rapidly as it goes back into the interior of the building and becomes almost a completely black background without me doing anything in post-production. And again, again, that gives me the figure ground separation that I'm looking for. This is captured with an 85 mil lens at the maximum aperture 1.8 because the subject has turned to put both eyes at the same distance from the lens and we can see quite clearly how shallow the depth of field is in, in this instance. The ears are out of focus, the tip of the nose is out of focus, even the eyebrows are getting a little bit unsharp compared to the pin sharp eyes. Okay. This creates a certain look that uh, we do like, um, I have to say, but um, you you have to um, know that uh, the camera is going to work with you to get those eyes reliably sharp most of the time.
And I have uh, a 98, 99% success rate with my Sony and Prime lenses that I'm using with the help of that IAF. Here's another example of that open door technique again that I'm using. And this um, time again, I've got the character to use the doorway and lean and relax. And occasionally you can get people to look off camera and sometimes you will ask them to uh, look back uh, down the barrel of the camera lens. One of the things that I do when I'm photographing in these situations is I I never have the camera um, uh, at my face for more than a few seconds. I keep the conversation going to keep every, everything relaxed and just uh, point, shoot and then lower the camera almost straight away. Uh, here's one that uh, again um, just um, uh, a very fleeting moment but again we're using a sort of a natural open door here I didn't actually ask this character in Ubud in Bali uh, to lean on the doorway or to stand in front of the doorway this was just a, a natural open door portrait and this was taken with an 85 mil Battis uh, wide open at f1.8 okay um, let's look at uh, other situations where the background may not be perfect Here's an example of a, a guy. The lighting is quite flat, so that's okay, but the background is, um, is a motor vehicle. It's cluttered. Uh, he's leaning back. Um, he's got sunglasses on. Look at the timestamp here. It's 10.40.29. Now, I'm carrying a piece of black fabric in my camera bag, and I've asked uh, my assistant just to move around the back of this subject and uh, completely change uh, the way this character is photographed. As my subject is moving around the back with the black piece of fabric that will be held as a new backdrop, I'm asking the guy to remove his sunglasses. So this is 10.41 uh, and 7 seconds. So 38 seconds has elapsed. And what we can see here is a very different portrait. Uh, we've got a character now whose eyes are really coming uh, to life. And um, the background is no longer distracting because it's just a piece of black fabric. This was actually photographed with a 50mm 1.8 lens at maximum aperture um, to give us that shallow depth of field again, which is giving us that beautiful bokeh um, or blur at the sides of the face there. Okay, so let's uh, look at introducing flash. It is a popular thing that a lot of amateur photographers get into and it has to be a skill for professional photographers working in portrait. I, I don't use flash as my first port of call. I much prefer the ambient light if and when I can use it. But in some situations uh, when I'm trying to create a certain look um, then the flash will be introduced. Okay, so let's uh, look. This is actually an image that I um, shot of this uh, cowboy, Randy Ryman, in Montana. And we actually haven't used flash. I've also had to lower the exposure slightly in exposure compensation to stop the very bright uh, rim of that um, hat from clipping, from losing detail. So, but I've actually managed to um, recover the shadows and also the highlights uh, in post-production. I've just grabbed the highlights and brought them down, grabbed the shadow slider and brought it up. And we can actually create a, a very sophisticated, uh, well-lit portrait with a little bit of help in post-production. So I didn't need to use fill flash in this instance. Um, a lot of full frame sensors, they're very forgiving of having the shadows opened up in post-production. So I don't pull the flash out immediately when I see how harsh the lighting conditions are. I know uh, the uh, the limitations of post production, and so I know that the character is still uh, the character of the lighting is still good without using flash. The times that I do use uh, fill flash um, are usually not with portrait. Uh, I'll often use them uh, maybe in wooded areas with wildlife. And if I am using that fill flash in those environments, I'll uh, push the ISO of the camera uh, very high, maybe 3200 or sometimes even higher, uh, because I want the flash to supplement the ambient light. I don't want the, uh, the, the flashlight to become the hero element or the hero lighting in this shot. So the, the flash or fill light in this one is really quite subtle. You can actually pick it up in the next shot um, because of the branch the bird is uh, sitting on. And you can see the secondary shadow uh, 
um, from that flash uh, just hitting the tail underneath that branch and you can also see, uh, see the catch light of the flash in the uh, the bird's eye there um, typically I would have the flash compensation dial down to minus one or minus two stops in this instance so the ambient light is still the hero in these situations you could apply the same technique to um, to people in the shadows um, uh, that uh, you want to create a little bit of a uh, pop uh, of detail um, but um, again Fill flash is usually not my main lighting um, uh, uh, technique when working with flash. Um, if I'm going to be working with flash, typically I will get the flash off the camera. And in order to do this, um, we need to work with trigger systems uh, on the uh, uh, Sony's that I'm using. They refer to the trigger as a commander. And then in order for the commander to talk to the flash now that it's off the camera, we need a flash that can uh, um, uh, uh, receive those signals, those radio signals, or we need to buy receiver units to, to put those flashes on. And this is basically radio communication now between the camera and um, the flash that we're using. Now, um, I typically don't like harsh light sources when dealing with portrait, as we've looked at in this uh, tutorial already. So I'm going to want to spread that light to make it softer or diffused. And uh, typically I will be looking at using something like um, an umbrella and a lighting stand if that flash is going on to that lighting stand. Now the um, uh, the umbrellas are perhaps the cheapest inroads into these um, um, lighting modifiers and I would advise that you have one that can have a, b a black cover to the um, to the umbrella because uh, if you are bringing this into an interior it's a way of stopping the light spilling out onto adjacent walls and then bouncing around the room so you're in much more control with an umbrella that has a black background or black backing. Sometimes they're removable, uh, but you do want to have access to that black in some situations. Other lighting modifiers that you might see that are a little bit more expensive, uh, things like uh, soft boxes and beauty dishes. Um, I've actually got uh, the product on the left of this slide here, um, which is um, uh, can be converted from uh, a beauty dish into a soft box if I need to. And the whole thing is very, very portable. It can be collapsed down and uh, put inside a messenger bag when, uh, when it's uh, getting carried around because I do tend to travel very light. The other ten thing that uh, I will also carry um, if I don't have an assistant is basically this S bracket that you see on the right side. This is a way of quickly putting your um, uh, speed light or flash inside there. It's very quick. It just takes a few seconds to put into that bracket. It basically gives you a good hold on there and will also support the lighting modifier. Now the lighting modifiers, they come generally with um, a, a a couple of different um, uh, mount systems. Uh, typically they're often referred to as Elinchrom or Bowen's mounts. And so if, you, if you're uh, buying an S bracket to hold the lighting modifier, maybe on a monopod, uh, maybe in your hand, um, then you're wanting to make sure that you get a good match between the lighting modifier and the S bracket that you're using. Okay, so uh, this is uh, an example. Uh, I was doing this at a university for some students, um, showing them uh, this technique uh, playing out. I've actually got the same character in the same shot twice, but I'm only using one um, light source for this. The other thing that I'm um, doing in this particular lighting technique, and I'll go into this in, in a little bit of detail, is that I'm underexposing the ambient light. So I've got um, a, a situation where the small light uh, source that I'm using, the flash that I'm using, um, can um, have um, the hero element in the shot. I'm actually seeking out um, shadows. Uh, I'm not going to be using this in full light because it's very difficult for a small flash unit 
to compete uh, with the sun. Um, so if we push down into shadows or use the uh, late part of the day or when the light, the ambient lighting isn't very bright, then we've got a little bit more control how that flash looks. And in this particular instance, I've underexposed the ambient by two stops and correctly exposed the flash, which is why we're getting such a lot of figure ground separation, not just because of focus, but also because of tonality. If we look at um, my technique here is uh, I'll typically before I even switch the flash on I'll be looking for an exposure that under exposes the ambient light. Now you can use this in um, uh, uh, auto mode uh, TTL uh, through the lens. Uh, we can usually use an exposure compensation dial to lower the ambient uh, light exposure. Um, in this instance I'm pushing it down to um, um, two stops under and then we correctly expose the flash. Um, now you're looking at my technique here uh, using a small handheld speed light and uh, a lighting diffuser or scrim. You'll see that um, uh, the light is spread beautifully over the broad surface of that diffuser, giving me a reasonably soft light on this character. The reason this particular image is out of focus, it's begun, going to become the background plate behind the hero element, which is the figure in the foreground there, which was uh, shot on a different image. And then the two were montaged together inside of Adobe Photoshop. OK, so let's uh, look at that technique one more time. I'm looking for a location out of the sunlight and maybe on this underpass uh, underneath this bridge uh, is a perfect location to do that. Um, and because again, as I said, the, the flash can become a hero element when we want the ambient light to be subservient or just applying a little bit, uh, a small amount of fill uh, to the flash, which is now our primary light source. So again, um, I will set up um, often a three point lighting um, setup for this. Three point means that we've just got uh, three sources of light and I'm listing them here. Uh, one is that umbrella on the lighting stand with the number one there, uh, top right. Number two is actually the ambient light itself. That ambient light, even though I'm underexposing it, is going to be softening uh, the lighting of the flash. And then we've got number three, which is a, a much smaller um, uh, flash unit, which doesn't have a lighting modifier and is being um, fired directly at the edge of the subject to give us that rim light. Again, choosing uh, an exposure um, that will give me um, two stops underexposed. This is how the image would look if the flash wasn't switched on. It basically gives that darker background that we're looking at. Then we put the flash on, we correctly expose. In this instance, I'm raising um, the, uh, the flash uh, exposure compensation because my subject is wearing white and this would lead to some underexposure because uh, the exposure metering systems in the cameras and the flash units uh, want to make everything mid-tone. In this particular instance, the subject is brighter than mid-tone. So I just need to push the exposure compensation a little bit higher in this instance. So so ambient light under, flash compensation up and gives me that nice balance. Uh, and again, we're creating that slightly darker background, giving me that figure ground separation. OK, so there is the setup in a slightly different position in this underpass. And, and um, again, um, Slightly less um, uh, figure ground separation now, mostly done through the focus, but again that background wall is underexposed because of the ambient light. The reason that the, um, the background isn't quite as dark as before is we're getting light spilling from my main flashlight now onto the wall which is quite close to the subject. OK, but they're again we're now returning uh, to um, that um, uh, where the, uh, the background is much further away, the light falls off, so we're going to get that much darker background. In this instance, I've actually left that little um, uh, secondary rim light in view, uh, bottom left-hand corner, and that is giving that beautiful edge there. If I didn't like that, I could just crop that a little bit tighter. You do have to be a little bit wary of flare coming um, from uh, your secondary rim light. If the angle of view or the spread of light coming from that rim light is too broad, you might have it spilling onto the front of your lens. So I would uh, encourage you to use a lens hood in these instances and just narrow the angle of view 
uh, of the flashlight. Uh, most flashes have a zoom capability so they can spread their light wide or come down to a narrower beam. And in this instance, uh, we're just avoiding uh, the flare in this instance. Okay, so here is um, uh, one of the portraits that we looked earlier. Um, this is um, a portrait of my subject just using ambient light. The background is actually sunlit um, and I've uh, positioned the subject under a little bit of shade um, that I found uh, in the open area. And I just wanted to show you this. Uh, this is um, ambi uh, ambient only, but uh, as an alternative, I'm going to use my um, beauty dish as, uh, as, uh, as the primary light now and underexposed by two stops. So I'm showing you that um, the light source that I'm using there. And we're getting underneath uh, the, the light source isn't held too high. Typically, I would hold uh, the light source slightly higher than eye level. But in this instance, I brought it down slightly because of that peaked cap. But now we can see how dark that background goes. If we're wanting that figure ground separation of focus, I would also encourage you to um, um, look at the technique carefully before you try this um, with uh, in, in a photographic situation. Uh, you might want to test this because if we're working with sunlight sometimes uh, and an open aperture, sometimes you might need to employ a technique called high speed sync. I use um, fa uh, shutter speeds faster than the maximum sync speed of your camera. Your camera and flash need to talk together quite well in order to do this high speed sync. Alternatively, if you only have a, a cheap manual flash, is to put a neutral density filter on front of the camera. This allows you to open up um, a little bit wider without overexposing the background. Uh, typically, we can't open up to f 1.8 um, on, a, on a sunlit day and not have that background overexposed. So we might need to use a, an ND filter or high speed sync to prevent that from happening. OK, when I'm positioning my um, main flashlight, um, if you don't have a modeling light, you'll need to take one image and then review the image to see where the light is falling. Now I'm giving you an example um, of uh, a shot that I showed earlier where the light is coming through an open doorway and window. And typically in this instance uh, with this character on the right, I will uh, ask the character just to angle their head slightly so we get a small amount of the light falling onto the shaded side of the face. This is a, a very um, well-known lighting technique called Rembrandt lighting. Now typically you don't want a triangular shadow coming off the nose when the light source is harsh. Typically you want the um, any shadows coming from the nose to extend out and touch the shadows on the extreme um, shaded side of the face. So we're getting a triangle of light now, if you look at Rembrandt lighting, you can see some very obvious high contrast examples of this played out. But often it can be very difficult to notice that subtle um, uh, illumination on the shaded side of the face uh, unless you're really looking for it. One of the techniques to help you see the light on a face is, is basically just to squint your eyes slightly. Uh, this will help you see the contrast of the lighting amplified uh, and there you might be able to notice. And so I'm showing you um, uh, the position of my primary light and uh, often I'm practicing on a mannequin if I'm practicing with a, a new light source uh, or a new lighting technique. And this is uh, again with the mannequin. Uh, I'm now, uh, now that I've got my uh, main primary light, um, uh, the angle of that light identified, um, what I'm going to do now is put in that uh, rim light. Okay. Typically you don't need a very powerful um, light source for that rim light because um, often I have my rim light uh, dialed down and they're typically only working at, at a very small uh, amount of their maximum power output. Uh, once you get into um, lighting off camera, um, to start playing with uh, uh, variations in three-point lighting is something that you might get uh, in, um, into. Um, here I'm showing you a three-point lighting um, and I've listed them as A, B and C. Now on my commander I'm controlling, um, this time in manual rather than TTL, I'm controlling the power output of each of those flash units. 
and you can see the key light, the soft light that's illuminating the model is being fired off at half power. Uh, the background, which is a big soft box, is being fired off at just 1 16th power. And the rim light um, is being fired off at just 1 64th power. So those um, three lights are of equal power and you can see the, uh, the power uh, ratio of each light source to create that effect there. In another um, um, example, this time using a dark background, we can see the primary light, uh, maybe a little bit of soft if the primary light is a little bit um, harsh for your subject because the primary light source isn't broad enough. Uh, that's one a reason to put a little bit of fill light. Typically the fill light comes from the position of the camera. Um, uh, whereas um, um, the primary light might be to uh, one side to create directional uh, shaping of the face and then dropping in the rim light again. Uh, sometimes you have to be very careful with those rim lights. They can spill. If you just get the angle of that rim light slightly um, uh, awkward, uh, the rim light can hit uh, the tip of the nose. And, um, and that's usually resolved just by repositioning the rim light or asking the model to turn slightly. Okay, so uh, hopefully you've um, enjoyed uh, some of the uh, techniques uh, there. Just a thumbs up if you have and subscribe to the channel. Uh, if you want to catch up with me at an extended um, uh, period of time, I'm running a couple of workshops in the, the US next year. So uh, in September, I'll be in uh, Yosemite and Death Valley. And then uh, the, the, the tour that immediately follows up there will be doing the deserts and canyons. Uh, so if you're interested in spending uh, a week with me, you can catch up with this through World Photo Adventures. Uh, Darren Leal is the primary photographer there, uh, but, and I support him on a, a few of the workshops there. And uh, the two that I'll be spending with Darren uh, next year uh, are these two in the USA in September. Okay, so I'll uh, catch up with you next time. Uh, I'm Mark Gaylor, and uh, hopefully uh, you've uh, enjoyed this presentation.